If you want to be more persuasive, use the power of practical specificity. Here's how. If rhetoric is about getting people on the same page, then persuasion is a specialized use of rhetoric designed to get people to do the same thing. If nobody does anything after listening to what you say or reading what you write, then they haven't really been persuaded, even if they like what you said. So it's always disappointing to see somebody think they're being persuasive and then create an argument that doesn't really try to motivate its audience to act in any way. It's a missed opportunity and it's especially unfortunate because it means you could be under the illusion that you're doing something useful when in fact you're not really doing anything at all. With that in mind, I want to spend a few minutes today talking about the power of practical specificity so that you can sharpen your arguments and make them more persuasive. I see a lot of arguments that are neither practical nor specific, which means that they can't ever be very persuasive. And to see what I mean by that, let's imagine that you're trying to persuade your dear friend to go into the kitchen to get you some ice cream. If you want ice cream, but you adopt the strategy that I see most often in so-called persuasive papers, you might say something like, you know, ice cream is a very good food that benefits friendships. That's an argument that isn't very practical. It's not asking anyone to do anything, just stating an opinion. And it's not very specific. It just makes a general statement about ice cream and the concept of friendship. It would be pretty reasonable for your friend to say, oh yeah, I feel the same way, and then never get you any ice cream. And I suppose a lot of people think they're being persuasive when they present broad ideological opinions like that, but then they're disappointed when nothing in the world changes. And why would anything change? They haven't presented an argument that asks their audience to do anything, so they shouldn't be surprised when nobody does. Using a really broad, ideas-focused argument is maybe a little like trying to slice a tomato with a rolling pin. When you do that, the force gets applied to too big of an area and you just end up crushing the poor thing instead of slicing through it. And a broad argument likewise spreads your persuasive force over too great of an area, reducing its effectiveness. It just isn't very likely that your friend is going to get you a scoop of ice cream if all you do is make a general statement about how good you think ice cream is. So obviously, a rolling pin is not a great tool for cutting. The cutting edge is too wide or too broad to apply the right kind of force. If you want to have a chance of cutting that tomato, you need something with a narrower edge. A butter knife is definitely a better tool than a rolling pin, but as you can see, it's still not an ideal choice. It will get the job more or less done, but it's not hard to imagine something even better. Just as you'd look for a sharper tool when you're trying to slice a tomato, it's a good practice to look for a narrower argument when you're trying to be persuasive. So instead of just telling your friend ice cream is good as a way of persuading them to get you some, you might say, I would really appreciate it if you got me some ice cream. See how this persuasive request is different? It doesn't just articulate your pro ice cream position. Instead, it communicates specifically that you want some and it gives your friend a clear indication of what you hope they'll do about it. Your friend can't just hear this argument and say, oh yeah, I agree, and then do nothing about it. The second argument is more specific and more practical, which makes it much more likely that something will actually happen. But even when I see that people have gotten the idea that their argument should be practical and specific, they still sometimes have trouble getting their arguments to be as specific and practical as possible. A butter knife is a workable solution to slicing tomatoes, but what about a sharpened chef's knife? This tool has an even narrower cutting edge, focusing the cutting force into an even smaller part of the tomato, leading to clean cuts and no spilled guts. A narrower cutting edge leads to more precise and effective slicing. Again, in a similar way, a narrower argument leads to more precise and effective persuasion. Imagine saying to your friend, I would appreciate it if you got me a scoop of strawberry ice cream. It's in the freezer next to the ice and the bowls are in the cabinet by the sink. Can you see why a more specific and practical argument is immediately more effective? Not only does your friend know where you stand on the issue of ice cream, but they'll know what to do about it. And more importantly, they'll know how to do it. If that's the argument you make, they could still reject it and tell you to get your own, but if they accept it, they have to do something about it. They can't just agree, they have to act in some way. So sharpen your argument, make it as narrow and practically specific as possible, and it will be far more effective at persuading your audience to do something meaningful, just in the same way that a knife with a very narrow cutting edge is a lot more useful for slicing tomatoes than a rolling pin. 
Now, you know that an argument is more effective when it's specific and practical, so how can you make sure that your argument is as sharp as possible? Well, as always, it depends on the situation, but here are a few things to keep in mind as you sharpen your argument's persuasive edge. First, think practically. One of the most common pitfalls that I see in failed persuasion is staying in the realm of ideas. So if you find yourself writing a paper and just expressing how you feel about an issue, stop and think about what you'd like your audience to do about that issue. Don't just write about an issue in theory. A lot of people have theories and opinions, and most of those opinions and theories are pretty uninteresting. When you think practically, you don't just show up with an opinion, you show up with a plan. And people are a lot more likely to listen to and be persuaded by someone who has an actual plan. Also, go beyond just telling readers what you think they should do, and take the extra step to show them how to do it. If a reader does agree with you and thinks that something should be done, they'll be grateful that you took the time to show them how to get started. Second, look for parts of an issue that you can address. Most of the pressing issues that we face are complex problems that involve many different factors. If you try to solve all of them at once, your paper is going to spiral out of control and you'll probably end up wearing yourself out. So don't try. It can be advantageous to narrow down to a more specific aspect or part of a problem that you then work on solving. So for example, maybe instead of trying to solve all of the issues related to the mental health of college students, you could narrow down to a specific aspect and write a paper about how colleges could do a better job of advertising their on-campus counseling resources to new students. And I keep saying it because it's still worth saying. If you're working with a page limit, it's especially wise to narrow down to a more specific aspect of a problem. Instead of failing to solve a big problem in eight pages, succeed in solving a small one. And third, think local. Nobody ever said that you have to solve a problem at a national or global level for it to be worth doing. And frankly, it's hard to imagine that a single paper even could. When we try to take on too much in a paper, it quickly becomes too broad and undoable. Instead, shrink your focus down to a local manifestation of that larger problem. For example, I once read a great paper that instead of trying to solve the national or global issue of the lack of women in engineering, chose to propose a mentoring program at a specific university in order to support the women who are studying engineering there. It would have been difficult to write a persuasive and actionable argument trying to address the whole national issue, but the author of that paper did a great job of writing a focused, purposeful, and persuasive argument that could have made a real difference. And they did it by looking somewhere closer to home where the larger issue was showing up. Now, of course, if you have a national platform and the power and influence to get things done on the national level, then by all means go for it. But most of us have smaller spheres of influence, and that's both normal and totally okay. There's nothing wrong with contributing to the work of solving big problems by actively solving the smaller ones. Besides that, it's important to remember that rhetoric doesn't happen in a vacuum and it's not all up to you there are other people writing arguments and working on trying to solve problems to improve the world. So don't try to do it all yourself. When you do, it's like trying to assemble a salad with just a rolling pin. Instead, find the sharpest, most specific knife you can and get to work slicing those tomatoes while somebody else chops the lettuce. Use your persuasive powers to gain allies so that you can work together to solve those bigger problems. Those are the kinds of situations that rhetoric was built for. Now, I'm sure you've got some specific and practical arguments of your own to work on, so I'll let you get to it. As always, if you have any questions or comments, just let me know. But if not, that's okay too. Thanks for watching and take care until next time.